Hello, greetings and welcome to Poetry as Prayer. It's been our weekly virtual gathering in which we set aside quiet time for retreat, meditation, and prayer through poetry readings of some famous mystics throughout the ages, both from our Christian tradition and from other traditions along with some sacred music to hopefully soothe our souls in this trying times. Hopefully you're finding ways to nurture your inner self through moments and times of silence and solitude. Our authors and poets and mystics that we have been reading and have been expressing those beautiful concepts of finding the sacred in the ordinary and in all things and in us. Today we again use Daniel uh, Ledinsky's book, Love Poems from God, and we'll be looking at two mystics of the East. They are famous elsewhere, but not necessarily to those of us in the West. First, I want to introduce a great religious reformer a famous artist and musician who is known as Kabir, K-A-B-I-R. Interestingly, Kabir achieved a synthesis of Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, and even Christian beliefs. First, to uh, usher us into a prayerful, meditative mood, let's begin with some music that comes from a poem. And the story goes that this poem was found scrawled on the wall of a building in Germany at the end of World War II. The poem read, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love even when I feel it not. I believe in God even when God is silent. This is the choir of St. Olaf College singing even when he is silent.
Kabir was a 15th century Indian mystic poet and saint. His writings influenced a Hindu movement, and his verses are also found in Sikh scripture. Yet his early life was as a Muslim. He later became strongly influenced by his teacher, the Hindu leader Ramananda. Kabir is known for being very critical both of Hinduism and Islam. He thought that their followers were misguided by the Vedas in Hinduism and by the Quran in uh, the Islamic faith. But during his lifetime, he was threatened by both the Hindus and the Muslims. Yet after his death, both have claimed and revered him as their own. Present-day readers sometimes think of him as a tough guy, a zen bruiser, a divine smart aleck, but at times uh, in his writings he can reveal tenderness and humor in his verse. So here are some poems as prayers from the Indian mystic known as Kabir. This one is called, How Humble is God. God is the tree in the forest that allows itself to die and will not defend itself in front of those with the axe, not wanting to cause them shame. And God is the earth that will allow itself to be deformed by man's tools, but God cries Yes, God cries, but only in front of God's closest ones. And a beautiful animal is being beaten to death, but nothing can make God break God's silence to the masses and say, Stop! Please stop! Why are you doing this to me? How humble is God? I wept when I knew. This is one telling us, once again, the value and importance of stillness. It's called a great pilgrimage. I felt in need of a great pilgrimage, so I sat still for three days, and God came to me. Can we take advantage of this? enforced stillness as times to be alone with God. This one's called, Where the Shopkeeper Would Say. I was looking for that shop where the shopkeeper would say, there's nothing of value in here. I found it and did not leave. The richness of not wanting wrote these poems. Not wanting, not grasping, finding a shop where nothing is of value so you don't have to want anything. Hard to know if he's a Sufi mystic, a Hindu, a Sikh, or maybe a Buddhist. Non-attachment to things. This one's called, I Had to Seek the Physician. I had to seek the physician because the pain this world caused me. I could not believe what happened when I got there. I found my teacher. Before I left, he said, up for a little homework yet? Okay, I replied. Well then, try th thanking all the people ha who have caused you pain. They helped you come to me. Sometimes we can find blessings in our pain, in our misfortunes. We just may not realize it at the time. This one's called, Where Do the Eyes of Women Fall? If your pockets were happy with coins and into a fancy store they brought you, where would the eyes of women fall? Our clothes chat with other clothes as they pass. 
Though who but a sweet young creature could care so much about how they look? But if a mirror ever makes you sad, you should know that it does not know you. So who are you, the real you? Why do we care how we look? How many hair and nail salons do we need? This one's called, It Stops Working. Look what happens to the scale when love holds it. It stops working. And this last one from Kabir shows some, some of his tenderness. It's called, No Harm Done. There is a sword in a museum not far from me. It was once used by a great prince who defended his country and faith, and many limbs and heads it severed. One day that sword will die, as all things will, and it will stand before God. And the sword's eyes will behold the splendor of heaven behind our beloved. And the sword will wonder with all of its heart, Will God let me in because of my life? And God will say to that sword, as God does to every creature, No harm done. No harm done. Forever welcomed are all. That difficult concept of unconditional grace. If only we believed it. We now have a second interesting Indian mystic that lived during the same time. She was born in 1498. She is the most renowned woman poets, poet saint of India whose songs were also sung by Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs alike. She's known as Mira, M-I-R-A. Mirabai was born well-to-do as a princess in India, and she began a devotion to Krishna, an Indian deity, at a young age. She was forced by her parents into an arranged marriage, but her husband soon died thereafter, and she began seeking out the company of wandering ascetics, known as the sadhus. And she was drawn to public temples that were the place of the lowest caste of the Indian society. She's known for her singing and dancing and embracing of the untouchables. And in her 30s, she renounced her royal title and she fled. And she became a wandering ascetic. She was a champion of human rights and of women's rights. And her songs often glorify the ascetic life. Even today, her songs are very popular throughout the streets and of the cities and villages of India. Mira spent her last years attending to the destitute and writing poetry. Here are some poems from the Indian mystic Mira. This one is called Such Wisdom. You should act more responsibly, God with all that gorgeousness you possess. You have made all of my friends nuts and basically unfit to do much else but dream of you and plot drawing your mouth close again. The soup kitchens are complaining about our wisdom of getting drunk all day on the gossip we share about you. That familiarity and love of God. Here's one that tells us about beauty. It's called A Hundred Objects Close By. I know a cure for sadness. Let your hands touch something that makes your eyes smile. I bet there are a hundred objects close by that can do that. 
Look at beauty's gift to us. Her power is so great, she enlivens the earth, the sky, our soul. Uh, what is beauty? Let your hands touch something that makes your eyes smile. What makes your eyes smile? This one's called One's Mind. He was too shy to sing, but I taught him. The sky's voice is such that one's mind must be very quiet to hear God speak. Can we be quiet? One's mind must be very quiet to hear God speak. This one again talks about the stillness and quiet. It's called a great yogi. A yogi is simply one who practices yoga and many times meditation. She says, in my travels, I spent time with a great yogi. Once he said to me, become so still you hear the blood flowing through your veins. One night, as I sat in quiet, I seemed on the verge of entering a world inside so vast, I know it is the source of all of us. That stillness and quiet where you can enter a world inside so still that you hear the blood flowing through your veins. Here's an interesting one called Use the Geometry. God left God's fingerprint on a glass the earth drinks from. Every religion has studied it, Churches and temples use the geometry of those lines to establish rites and laws and prayers and our ideas of the universe. I guess there's just no telling how out of hand, how wonderfully wild things will get when our lips catch up to God's. So we can almost see God's fingerprints in the world and on the earth, but how wonderfully wild will it get when we actually catch up to God? This one again talks about beauty. It's called A Limb Just Moved. You taught your songs to the birds first. Why was that? And you practiced your love in the hearts of animals before you created humanity. I know the planets talk at night and tell secrets about you. A limb just moved before me. The beauty of this world is causing me to weep. If we are awake and aware to the beauty. Here's one by Mira called Preference. Might fit with us each day as we wake up in our in our uh, social distancing. Stuck with another day, how should we pass it? If anything worked for you before, I'd give that preference. A very short one called Fragile. So fragile, this petal, the earth, as fragile as love. Sometimes we forget how fragile our earth is. And here's one talking about closeness to God. 
called The Way They Held Each Other. A woman and her daughter were destitute and traveling to another country where they hoped to find a new life. Three men stole them while they were camping. They were brought to a city and sold as slaves, each to a different owner. They were given one minute more together before their fates became unknown. My soul clings to God like that, the way they held each other. How our souls cling to God. And this one is on the topic of what through the years in Christian uh, meditative life is known as the examine, the uh, examine of consciousness or examine of spirit. It's when you, at the end of your day, you review the day and determine in your mind what of the events of the day, what was life-giving and what was not. She calls it, I'd call that. Before I fell asleep last night, I laid awake and wondered, what did I achieve this day just roaming around calling God's name? So I brought before my mind's eye all who I had been kind to, and it turned out to be all things that I had seen. I'd call that one hell of a productive day. And this last one from the Indian mystic Mira, called Mira Knows Why. The earth looked at God and began to dance. Mira knows why, for her soul too is in love. If you cannot picture God in a way that always strengthens you, you need to read more of my poems. Can we do that? Picture God in a way that always strengthens you. That's Indian mystic Mira. And lastly today, I always like to bring in a couple of poems from a present day poet. And today we'll read some from Irish poet and philosopher John O'Donohue. O'Donohue is known for his very Celtic lifelong fascination with the inner human landscape, what he called the invisible world. He insisted on beauty as a human calling. His first book, for which he became famous, was called Anam Kara. It was published in 1997. It, it was a synthesis of Celtic philosophy, poetry, and spirituality. It became an international bestseller. His final work was called To Bless the Space Between Us, and it was published posthumously after his unexpected death in 2008. He was born in 1956 in Western Ireland. That's a historically a crucible of Celtic Christianity, which merges this strong sense of mystery with the passionate embrace of nature and the body and the senses. The divine is understood as manifest everywhere in everything, which as we've seen is a common theme uh, among our mystics. John O'Donohue entered seminary at a young age. He became a Catholic priest for 19 years. But in the 1980s, he went to Germany to study philosophy, and he eventually left the priesthood and devoted himself full-time to meditating and writing. O'Donohue's voice and writings continue to bring ancient mystical wisdom to modern confusions and longings. Here's one from John O'Donohue called For Loneliness. When the light lessens, causing colors to lose their courage, and your eyes fix on the empty distance that can open on either side of the surest line, 
to make all that is familiar and near seem suddenly foreign. When the music of talk breaks apart into noise and you hear your heart louden while the voices around you slow down to leaden echoes, turning silence into something stony and cold. When the old ghosts come back to feed on everywhere you felt sure, do not strengthen their hunger by choosing fear. Rather, decide to call on your heart that it may grow clear and free to welcome home your emptiness, that it may cleanse you like the clearest air you could ever breathe. Allow your loneliness time to dissolve the shell of dross that had closed around you. Choose in this severe silence to hear the one true voice your rushed life fears. Cradle yourself like a child, learning to trust what emerges, so that gradually you may come to know that deep in that black hole you will find the blue flower that holds the mystical light which will illuminate in you that glimmer of springtime. That's called for loneliness. This one is from his last book, To Bless the Space Between Us, a book of blessings. It's actually the last part of a poem that's titled For the Breakup of a Relationship, but seems it might be relevant in our time of distancing. He says, This is the time to be slow. Lie low to the wall until the bitter weather passes. Try as best you can not to let the wire brush of doubt scrape from your heart all sense of yourself and your hesitant light. If you remain generous, time will come good and you will find your feet again on fresh pastures of promise where the air will be kind and blushed with beginning. And this one's called On Waking. John O'Donohue. I give thanks for arriving safely in a new dawn, for the gift of eyes to see the world, the gift of mind to feel at home in my life. The waves of possibility breaking on the shore of dawn. The harvest of the past that awaits my hunger. And all the furtherings this new day will bring. That's contemporary Celtic poet John O'Donohue. I want to go ahead and mention another website that you might find helpful. It's uh, Krista Tippett's website, onbeing, O-N-B-E-I-N-G, onbeing.org, where she interviews poets and mystics and writers. We're going to end today with music, and to go along with our Celtic poet O'Donohue, I thought we might finish with a version of a very familiar Irish hymn. This is sort of a peppy version. This group is known as Celtic Worship, and the hymn is Be Thou My Vision. A final blessing from O'Donohue. May you awaken to the mystery of being here and enter the quiet immensity of your own presence. May you have joy and peace in the temple of your senses. See you next week. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. 
not be all else to me save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my life Thou my wisdom and thou my true word I ever with thee and thou with me Lord Thou my great Father and I thy true Son Thou in me dwelling and I I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine in heaven.